much, Gavin. And uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome back. I'd have to say it's really inspiring to see so many interested folk here. And uh, I take a great heart from the fact that I don't actually recognize quite a lot of you. So I take it that you're actually people who choose to be here, you know, you're members of the, the community you live around here. So that's, that's great. And I've, thanks for the uh, opportunity to have this uh, little bit of a privileged platform to air my thoughts on. And hopefully this will be a, a, a suitable way to start thinking about the important issues relating to uh, the early Middle Ages. Now, in my view, we, we shouldn't be too interested today in, in, in things like com composing wish lists of sites to be explored or collections that we should examine. And I don't, also don't think we should be, in a forum like this, overprivileging professional opinions such as my own. Um, I'm not interested in being that person who's kind of pronouncing and setting agendas and establishing priorities. I don't think that's particularly productive, potentially, uh, you know, kind of reflects a sort of arrogant view about uh, knowledge and so on. Um, and I think um, it also tends to ignore the, the role that, in archaeology, the significant role played by chance, serendipity, and circumstances beyond our control. So this is, um, so this is a critical process, I think, this, this type of meeting. And the regional scarfs in particular, I think, are important. They, they address one of the issues which we heard, which is problematic with the, the scarf in general, which is that the revision of the, the national scarf is, is well, we, it's not really possible. So the regional approach allows it to be, if you like, revised bit by bit. And hopefully these new uh, regional scarfs will be more flexible and allow uh, revision going forward. Now, it's, this isn't just my uh, a question of like my personal preferences about open, participatory, democratic heritage, you know, access. It's how I actually understand archaeology to work in the contemporary world. For archaeology to be sustainable, for effective research programs in archaeology to work, they have to be grounded in the community. And that brings its own requirements. And the first of which is discussion and you know, that's why I'm so excited to be here because this is, this is what, this sort of uh, uh, opportunity to have these discussions. Now we, we need to think about the, the principles which we bring to this and one of them is about the evidence. The period of uh, early historical archeology span is so-called because the first native texts we have are date from this period, but I think the most generous thing we can say about them is that they are patchy and they certainly can't sustain a coherent historical narrative. We get disjointed facts. Uh, some people like to stitch these together into a, 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 a story, but I don't think we have enough points to kind of join up and connect the dots, if you like. Um, to paraphrase Leslie Alcock, the documents we have are there to tell us what we don't know, to tell, point out the gaps. And so where they exist, interaction with them is critical and requires kind of specialist expertise. And, and I would imagine and as, you know, any sensible strategy would involve involving historians. In the, in the last half century, since radiocarbon dating became routine, our chronologies of sites of all periods have been continuously refined. And this process of accumulating data, I'm sure will continue through small-scale excavations, in, in other interventions, whether they're you know, archaeological or not. But what we should focus on are the interpretive themes required to make sense of the social political complexity that we can see in our texts. The qu questions worth understanding require robust theoretical frameworks. So the purpose of, of what we're doing, uh, I guess, is we have to first of all, decide who gets to decide what is worth trying to understand. What are the important stories that Perth and Kinross archaeology can tell? Now, Perth and Kinross has this rich heritage. It's on, it, it occupies a, a rich and varied landscape, as we've heard. It's crossed by the major eastern arterial, arterial routes. It's, and for an inland area, it has pretty good 
water connection with the wider world. Perhaps more importantly, it's at the geographic heart of the Kingdom of Scotland. So Perth and Kinross is really well placed to contribute uniquely to exploring Scotland's national narrative. But obviously, even Perth and Kinross can't address every archaeological question equally well. For instance, most of the soils around here do not favor the survival of bone, even on the really rich bits of land. So we have limitations. And these obviously apply to all periods, but they do frame what we can do. In deciding what the stories to investigate and communicate, we archaeologists need first to understand what the stories the people of Perth and Kinross, and I guess since some of these are national stories, what the people of Scotland as a whole are interested in. What interests them? What do they want to know more about? And crucially, what are they prepared to get actively engaged with? For, for some, uh, sorry, for some years now, archaeologists from all across the sector have been working on the uh, Scotland's strategic, uh, on the Scottish Strategic Archaeology Committee, and we've produced uh, the uh, Scotland's archaeology strategy. And our goal is to to make archaeology matter. We say we want a Scotland where archaeology is for everyone, a place where the study of the past offers opportunities for us now and in the future to discover, care for, promote, and enjoy our rich and diverse heritage, contributing to our well-being and knowledge and helping to tell Scotland's stories in their global context. Okay, so that's, we can, we've, we've all signed up to that, we can agree with that. What this makes plain is that a key pillar of the strategy and fundamental to this particular exercise is meaningful public engagement. Archaeology seeks to generate new knowledge about the past, but this doesn't, I would say, come from data accumulation. It comes from the integration of those data into explanatory frameworks, into narratives. And these narratives are not the exclusive domain of the professional. So I think, as a first principle, we should think that understanding derives from the, the process of archaeology as much as the evidence that's generated. Fieldwork programs, in particular, generate understanding through the practice or participation in the investigation. This is why we train students on site. It's why volunteer field workers are enriched immediately through their participation and not when they see their names on the acknowledgement page of a monograph that appears 10 years later, if we're lucky. Anyway, it's easy enough to understand this in the context of students and, and the public non-professional engagement but it, I think this is equally true for professionals. Archaeology is the original slow science. It's meticulous, it's painstaking, it's protracted. And because we know that the questions require working um, on complex sets of uh, evidence, in this context, the understanding matures with time. I mean, it's a well understood process in the making of whiskey, if not actually in higher education circles. Uh, so for instance, my engagement with Strathern's archaeology is a kind of extreme case in point. Um, I've been involved on and off since 1982, and I'm still learning. And short of being immersed here, I, I don't think my understanding could have been accelerated. So the questions which now seem most pressing took a long time to formulate, and the opportunity to focus on, in on it is, is what's a, a, at issue here. So, for instance, I didn't took ages to realize that the significance of the intermixture of parishes which characterizes the diocesan stru structure may indicate how the uh, medieval court was arranged around places like Fortiviat. And maybe we should think about what role these uh, parishes which are tied to different dioceses played in homogenizing the culture of the, the Gallic Kingdom of Alba? That, that would be a kind of subsidiary question. As you'll see, I'm not, as with many of the other speakers, I'm not very comfortable with these rigid periodizations. And my discussion, which is following, will bleed across and pick up late Iron Age issues and follow developments and into the later medieval era. So periodization is a conceptual tool, not intended to be constraining. We have to place the questions we ask of the remains of the past within a context. 
And this is complex, as it includes uh, um, you know, what we might think of as a kind of physical reality, what's out there we can recover, but it's also conceptual. What do we actually want to know? And here we're not confined to the opinions of the academic professional archaeologists. We need to engage with and elicit the uh, local concerns and local interests. So if we think about this early historic period from, say, the 5th to the 11th century, this is the period which saw the emergence of all the things which we characterize, which characterize medieval society and set the seeds for the narrative arc of a distinctive small European kingdom which changed direction only with the Reformation and the arrival of early modernity. In our period, the key transformation, in my view, from a post-Roman tribal society is, is, is to the uh, early medieval kingdom, this is a watershed development. But it's not an instantaneous change. The shift from kin-based organizations to institutional systems of government uh, is, is, is not instantaneous. It's a long, long process which is only sketched out faintly in our text, making archaeology essential for really getting to grips with it. We see these institutional seeds planted in the early historic era, many of which are associated with the emergence of the Gallic Kingdom of Alpa in the 10th and 11th centuries. These seeds grow and develop in scale and pervasiveness into, a, into the state institutions which characterize the, the kingdom. And uh, so they, they, they have a long uh, tail, if you like. So both this early and slightly later medieval phase of development, uh, we can identify themes which kind of mutate over the centuries and allow us to understand the lineages of power and of social evolution. And for convenience, I've identified some fairly conventional categories, ones which would not be out of place in a, a standard textbook. But I, I, this is just a, a convenience. I mean, these are not in, you know, independent categories. These are all interconnected. But for the sake of kind of our discussions, I think it's helpful to think about themes of religion, and particularly Christianity, but how it interacted with earlier and continuing spiritual traditions. Uh, we, we want to think about political power, whether this is talking about residential uh, centers or the, the, the process of assembly, these, these kind of popular gatherings which actually constitute power. And of course, the, th the third category, we, we might think of as being settlement and economy, um, which are obviously a very rural uh, pursuit in our period. <coughs> so if we think about the gaps, what have we got? So if we think about religion, uh, I think one of the first things we need to uh, uh, question is the, how do this post-Roman social developments, how do the things happening at the end of the Iron Age work out in, in Perth and Ken Ross. What evidence do we have for the reuse or engagement with prehistoric monuments? We, we see it growing day by day. What does that actually mean? And I imagine this is going to keep becoming more commonplace as more dates uh, come in. Is there a way, so we can see that can, uh, engagement with the earlier prehistoric past. I wonder if there's a way of gauging the influence of the Roman legacy. Obviously, there's some really striking situations. The church at, uh, in the center of Ardok Roman fort uh, is just aching to be uh, investigated. And I'm sure there's lots of other good opportunities if we just think about it for a minute. Do the Roman camps, for instance, direct us to places of significance to the Caledonians, places which perhaps had spiritual significance? Um, I think we have a major question here. How does pagan religion influence the Christian landscape? Are the sites of our churches uh, influenced that way? And that's very common elsewhere in Northwest Europe. So I think we might start thinking about that here as well. <coughs> Mostly this kind of dialogue is conducted in the context of Pictish symbol stones and burials. And there are some good examples where we might choose to investigate the relationship between uh, a stone and barrows, uh, we could do that, for instance, at uh, the Blackford Stone at Glen Eagles, if we were interested. Um, and 
we, we can't forget this kind of powerful force, that it, the interrelationship between burials, which is revealed by the, the, the stone at Inshira, reused in a long kiss cemetery. So the, the, there's a, a rich body of material here we can kind of explore. I think we can see it at a kind of more landscape basis as well. The, there's a, a cracking small church at uh, Ecclesia Magartel, just near Bridge of Urn, which has a, a you know, a, a surrounded by a, a number of healing wells, holy waters, which, uh, a, and, and it's in the shadow of this impressive hill fort, uh, the most impressive one in the Ockels, uh, Castle Law Forgandeni. And I feel that this is a kind of sacred landscape which is uh, waiting to be teased out. If we think about church buildings themselves, there's actually a, 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 a much, there's a, we have an even bigger gap in a way. Um, we don't have any complete dissection of a church. We have no Port Mahomac. And now it's hard to see how a program uh, in a substantial ru ru ruined church, say, just for, for uh, sake of argument, some, someplace like Muthal, I don't see how we would get, given the current historic Scotland, historic environment Scotland attitudes to burial archaeology, I think it might be difficult to, to, to do that. But it remains a priority, I think. We've got uh, a kind of opportunity also to start looking at these landscapes in a more Christian landscapes in a more sensible way. Now that the place name scholars have given us such clear signposts to identifying the sites, and this is starting to take shape in places like uh, Glen Lyon. If we turn to uh, uh, thinking about centers of political power, um, the kind of residential dimension of that, there's a kind of agreed trajectory of elite settlement from lowland brocks to nuclear hill forts like Dundurn or Dunkeld to undefended residences beginning with the Forteviate Palace and eventually emerging as these ecclesiastical palaces uh, tied onto Schoon and Dunfermline and so on. Only every step of this kind of sequence I've just sketched is, is tendentious and it begs significant questions. Um, we've, we can define these, the, these sites. We've, Leslie Alcock's pro, you know, agenda allowed us to recognize them and, and date them. So we have a chronology, but we need a detailed investigation of, of one of these places. And it's not that straightforward. At Forteviate, although we spent 10 years there, we didn't get our hands on any really unambiguous evidence for the palace. Um, it nevertheless has advanced our understanding of the emergence of Fort Eviet as a kind of royal court site, but it's not, uh, it's not really got to some key issues. As well as knowing a little of the detailed structure and function of these different forms of elite residence or the steps in between, um, you know, these are big problems. We, we could look at some place like uh, Castle Craig near Perny, where we excavated an impressive Brock Tower that was burnt and demolished in the second century. Should we imagine that similar Brocks underlie other Pictish nuclear forts? We wouldn't be surprised, but we don't know if there's a direct lineage there in between Caledonian power and Pictish power. And moreover, the ruined stump of Castle Cape Brock uh, was refortified many centuries later with a timber palisade perhaps in the 10th century. How does this refortification fit into the narrative? Is it related to the Viking Wars, for instance? We don't know. We, but there, so there's, what I'm saying is there's lots of kind of uncertainty in this whole scheme of things. And, and I think the longer we look at these things as isolated sites, the harder it will be to make sense of them. I think if we're looking for a, a, a really good opportunity to do this and explore this at a kind of long depth in a, 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 a in a kind of mature way we could look do a lot worse than uh, think about uh, Dunkeld as a future long-term research project so we've got um, we've also got these ceremonial power centers uh, which and here we know we're dealing with societies in which political authority was personal, was constituted through 
periodic public assemblies, and we're beginning to recognize them through place names and textual references. But we haven't really identified an archaeological signature based on the, the field remains. And we might imagine that based on the uh, Irish success at geophysics at royal sites, we might have a similar experience here. That so far hasn't proved to be the case. And I think we might need to be more ambitious. We might challenge, need to challenge the soil scientists out there about whether it's possible to identify ways of identifying you know, microscopic detritus of popular gatherings in soil chemistry and in, in micromorphology. We certainly, though, know that there's a kind of intimate relationship between these places of assembly and prehistoric monuments. Um, and I don't think the Picts really minded whether the hinges were ch chalcolithic or Neolithic. The final, uh, oops, final thing I wanted to, oops, what's happened? Um, The final thing I want to talk about is uh, about settlement. And uh, here, understanding settlement patterns is a, is a major challenge. And um, I'm sure that Dave Pollock, when he was working on Lunan Valley, Lunan Valley survey, was right in thinking that modern farms occupy many of the most attractive ancient settlements. Um, for instance, as you heard, in 10 years at SURF, we only encountered one unenclosed early historic settlement, a roundhouse within a, a, a complex of uh, prehistoric monuments. And I don't know if you picked up that uh, slight note of disdain uh, for that modern Pictish uh, house in uh, Dr. Wright's comments. But you know, the point is, it was just chance. Uh, so these things are going to continue to come out in a rescue context. But they're, they're going to be very hard to identify, even if we can start seeing some, perhaps some of these uh, rectangular uh, early buildings, very difficult to find in the area photographic record. And I think in this context, the visibility of upland sites can be kind of misleading. Pit karmic houses, you know, terrific. Uh, the, the one excavated by John Barrett and Jane Downs and published by Martin Carver tells us a huge amount about how that landscape was utilized. And similarly, it, 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 you know, the, David Strachan's work at Glen Shee kind of enhances all that. So they show this really interesting interplay between the early medieval longhouse and these earlier prehistoric landscapes. Is this typical? That's a question we have to ask. How do we get at the non-marginal places? And this, I suppose this is one of my suggestions that I'd like to, to, to consider is, I wonder whether the, one of the key resources for us are the policies of private estates, where obviously these are heavily designed landscapes that have been modified and compromised and so on, but they haven't been, uh, they've been, also they've been curated and protected from mechanization, they've been mapped often before the ordnance survey. So these, and these, more to the point, these are important places, these are high desirable places, they're in the thick of it, so they're not up a hill, they're, they're in the heartland, so I think they're a, a, a potentially a really important resource for us. Now this kind of takes us into the, the later medieval period as well. How do we understand the, the emergence of a kind of uh, territorial lordships? And there's been huge amounts of work by Scottish historians which have kind of transformed our understanding of this, which has not found its way into the archeology span yet. And uh, I think there's, huge possibilities in terms of thinking, a gap, if you like, in thinking about the, the uh, Christianity. We've got this, these terrific early stone church buildings, at Dunblane, Muthel, Dunning, Abernethy, St. Surf's, Loch Leven, which are a really rich resource. And the, the value of this, the, the complex biographies of these buildings, we know, we can understand that. We've had PhDs done on that, but it hasn't been followed up by archaeology. So it seems that if we were to take advantage of so the potentials of AMS dating to explore these buildings that would provide a really excellent platform for studying the beginnings of the church as a major social and political force. 
And we should recognize that we're really blessed in having this terrific corpus of Scottish medieval parish churches, uh, which is, you know, very helpful for Perthshire. You know, Dunblane, Dunkeld, and St. Andrew's Diocese are all there. Um, who cares about the rest of Scotland? Certainly the HRC doesn't, so. Um, just gonna wind up. So, in terms of uh, kind of future research priorities, I think one of the big ones is where are the women? I, don't, I can't think of a single early medieval research initiative in, in my area which has sent, you know, made women center to their investigation. Now everybody says, oh yeah, it's really hard to find them, and they, what, how do we find them? Well, that's our problem, and it's, it's one we have to address, and one we have to, uh, to, to start thinking about in a serious way, which we haven't done. We want to find out how these post-Roman social developments progress. We want to find out about uh, Christianity. Can we find a good site, a church site we could excavate? I'm, with permission, maybe we could. I just want to uh, say that, obviously, I, I could go on and we will have a chance to talk about this more, but my observations are really intended to stimulate some critical discussion and and really to focus in on these conceptual themes that we're going to be working with. And I think these need to be the foundation for decision making. These key themes and recognition of, recognition of the implication these themes pose for us, this is the only way we can be prepared and capable of seizing the opportunities presented by the chance, serendipity, and circumstances that we find ourselves in. And I think, finally, a community-focused public archaeology should all, it should be about confounding expectations. Confounding expectations. In Govan, we've challenged the prejudice of, uh, of one sort. And here we should think about challenging some of the prejudices that we all bring to uh, the archaeology of Perth and Ken Ross. So thanks very much.